Welcome to uh, International FinOps Day, which we were just discussing in the networking. Uh, it's actually tomorrow, uh, officially Internet, International FinOps Day, but we're kicking it off today. Um, I'm JR Stormitz. Uh, I am leading up the FinOps Foundation as executive director of the program. Uh, we're part of the Linux Foundation, uh, and I'm also the co-author of the uh, Cloud FinOps book. Coming to you today from uh, sunny Joshua Tree, California. Uh, usually, usually Portland, uh, about two hours east of LA here. Uh, we have uh, a lot of interesting stuff coming up. I did want to call out, though, as I was listening to the networking at the beginning, just how great the virtual events are. Like Catherine mentioned, how many that you're all able to attend and we're able to attend. Um, on this call, we've got speakers from London, uh, Austin, let you pull up the list here. We got people from Stockholm, New York. Uh, I think somebody, Mel is, uh, Melissa Lorton is, is phoning in from Panama. I hope her internet uh, is going to work well <laughs> while she's down there, but really excited to have you all here. This is our monthly summit that we do. Uh, we went to these large events uh, during COVID because we could pack a lot of people together on a lot of different topics. And today we've got three uh, topics that are all building on the state of FinOps challenges that we launched at the beginning of the year. So we're gonna cover three things. First is adopting FinOps. This is the output of a working group led by Ashley Ramatko that kicked off last month. That's all about executive buy-in. They're gonna share some of what they're covering. We're then gonna get into a new working group, uh, which is called Reducing Waste, led by Joe Daly, uh, that we're kicking off. And then also based on a Slack conversation uh, that a bunch of you had, we're gonna talk about data transfer, the goods, the bads, how to reduce it, how to look at it, how to think about it. I'm also excited to uh, welcome a few new governing board and technical advisory council members uh, who are here to help support our mission. Uh, for those of you joining also a couple of housekeeping, be sure to get into Slack. And if you're not running the Zoom client, you're just dialed in or connected via the web, you're not gonna get to pick your breakout at the end. We're gonna automatically put you into one. So get the Zoom client going if you wanna do that at the end. So for the new folks also, um, we are part of the Linux Foundation. We're one of their programs. Uh, and as part of that, we have three separate areas that we focus on. Uh, I'm hearing that my voice is cutting off a little bit. Can you all hear me still all right? Thumbs up, thumbs yeah, down. Yeah, JR, I can hear you just fine. Great. Yeah. Okay. Looks like it might just be that person's connection. So at the center of this is the practitioner community, which a bunch of you are part of. Uh, when we joined the Linux Foundation a year ago, there were 1,500 practitioners. There's now over 4,000 of you uh, who've joined uh, in the last 12 months. On either side of that are the two groups we're gonna be uh, meeting today and hearing from a lot. There's a technical advisory council, which is here to help drive best practices and standards. It's about 10 people, a mix of practitioners, cloud vendors themselves, platform vendors, industry luminaries who drive those forward. And the other side is the governing board, uh, which helps fund and support and drive strategy all in support of the practitioner community and the technical advisory council. Uh, and we are the foundation funded by two sources. And I wanted to thank you all, those of you who are uh, trained as FinOps certified practitioners uh, and those who are looking into the other programs we have, like the uh, FinOps for engineers. We've got a bunch more of these coming. Uh, thanks for being a part of that process with us. The other side of our funding comes from these fantastic uh, vendor member partners who have joined us uh, in the last year. Uh, who not only support in terms of financial support, but all of these six premier members in particular, uh, Cloud Health by VMware, Google Cloud, SADA, Deloitte, Accenture, and brand new one that we're gonna talk about and meet later, Vertisent, they're all contributing a lot of time. Uh, and this is where we encourage everybody, practitioner or vendor to plug in. These folks are all plugging in subject matter experts into the working groups, working alongside practitioners. Uh, and this is really where the magic happens when you become an active participant in this. Uh, we'd also like to thank all of the other general vendor members who have joined. We've got over 35 of those uh, who have also plugged in similar ways, helping with working groups and contributions to really share uh, knowledge and best practice to support the community. Uh, there's two new ones of those we're going to announce today. We get to meet uh, Yoda Scale and Replex. I'll hear from them shortly. But I wanted to, before we get in, cover the least fun slide. Uh, but I'm going to tell a story here, which is both a bummer and important to hear. Um, we have a strong code of conduct, uh, in addition to the Linux Foundation's code of conduct, uh, which we abide by, which focuses on three areas. First is, we want you to contribute, right? Be a part of this. Uh, start maybe listening, but then as you get used to the community, jump in with your knowledge. The second is, please be inclusive of all the other practitioners, your other vendors, all the people. Be respectful of them and their opinions. Uh, and the third one, really important, and the story I'm going to tell, the bummer story relates to this, is no sales pitches. 
If you're a vendor or a consultant or you're a fan of one of those, please don't say how great X, Y, and Z person is or company that you should use this one instead of this one. Focus on sharing best practices. Now, here's the bummer story. Uh, this month, we did have uh, a vendor who was able to collect a bunch of email addresses from our practitioners and send out unsolicited marketing emails. So if you received one of those, we are very sorry about that. We have censured that vendor. We have removed them from Slack. We're removing the offending people from all the various channels. Uh, we're very serious about this. No sales pitches, best practices, be here to support each other. Um, all the forums are here for that, the Slack, the events and whatnot. So if you see something that doesn't fit any part of the code of conduct, inclusion, respect, contribution, sales pitches, et cetera, uh, then please let us know. You can email me, I'm jr at finops.org, or you can email uh, membership at finops.org or, or stacy at finops.org, uh, any, anywhere you feel the most comfortable. We wanna hear from you. Uh, this community, I, I think we, we've created something, I hope, uh, special, and we wanna keep it that way. So thanks all for contributing and remembering these points. All right, so introductions. Uh, generally, offender, we, we feature, generally, more coffee, we feature new practitioners here. Uh, today, I wanted to take this time to highlight a bunch of new people that we've added to our governing board, leading strategy, and our technical advisory council, leading best practices and standards. And uh, I'm actually not gonna do the announcement. I'm gonna first announce, I can announce the people, I'm gonna announce a new chairperson for our governing board, uh, who I'm, I'm hoping is on here. One second, before I say who it is. I, I am. <laughs> oh no, you gave it away. I was gonna do an announce. Uh, so this person, not saying he, she, or otherwise, has been in the community for years. <laughs> she provided a ton of guidance to our members, uh, to our staff, and to the industry in general, advancing the discipline. Uh, this person has also taught some of our most highly rated FinOps classes. Uh, and she's building a, a pretty great international team. I know she's hiring as well, so I'll throw that out there, uh, that exemplifies all the FinOps principles and what's happened. So uh, very, very excited, Jen uh, Hayes from Fidelity to have you as our new governing board chair. Wanted to welcome you. Thank you for taking this on and give you a few minutes to talk about the governing board and all the new folks there. So thank you, Jen. Thank you uh, so much for the, the, and I'm sorry that I ruined the surprise. Um, I tend to do that. Uh, so. I think this is a great opportunity. Like JR said, I've been involved with FinOps and it's been a passion of mine for the last several years, um, both a passion from really understanding the concepts, applying them to a large enterprise, but also how to give back to the FinOps community itself, because I think that's a really important fundamental piece of um, what FinOps is, is really when we think about it, it's a, you know, with the mission, the community, the practitioners and the standards, those are the key three pieces for it. And from a governance board perspective, our purpose really is about making sure that we provide the process and the funds and the projects and the programs to really make sure that all three of those pieces are, um, we continually to mature them. It's been an amazing um, year since the foundation has really gone over to the Linux um, foundation and um, the growth that we have seen JR's highlighted a couple of the, the growth from a perspective of practitioners to go from 1,500 to 4,000. You know, you more than double your practitioners in, in a year time frame. Um, and let's face it, in a time frame that has been really fraught with all sorts of, um, of issues for everyone across the globe. Um, so this is, this is going to be a really passion of ours to really continue to grow these environments, again, to grow our community, our practitioners, and our standards. And so in 2022, what we're going to really focus on is developing programs and developing um, action plans to look specifically at each one of those and look at where we're going to go to in the future. Last year, we took a survey that went through and helped us identify these areas where you, where, where each of you were able to participate in saying, where do we need to grow? Where do we need to have more information? So we're going to build on that. Um, again, do another survey, make sure that where we're taking the foundation is in line with what you need for as a community and as a practitioner. So um, I'm really excited to be part of this um, in this, this upcoming year um, and would, you know, um, just uh, if anyone wants to reach out to me directly, you can do it on Slack. I got to tell you, I'm not that great at Slack, though, um, or through uh, the, my uh, foundation um, email, which um, I'm sure JR can, can provide at, um, at the end of the call. So, JR, I think, though, I get the opportunity yeah. to introduce some people. Indeed, all the new folks who are joining the, the various boards. 
Um, so I'm going to uh, hand the time over to each one of these people individually, where they're going to be able to give us just kind of a, um, a quick introduction of themselves and why they're um, they're so ha happy to participate um, in really leading um, the foundation. So we're going to start with Melvin. I think I saw you on Melvin Brown. So Melvin Brown is going to come to the TAC, um, and he is from the U.S. government. So Melvin, are you? I'm here. Good morning. I think it's morning. Yeah, it's still morning. <laughs> so good morning, everybody. Melvin Brown. I am the acting deputy CIO with the Office of Personnel Management here in the U.S. federal government. And I'm excited to be here. I've, I've read JR's books, been a fan uh, for a while now. Uh, his book actually led me here. But uh, what I'm most excited about is the ability to build a better government and to learn and leverage some of the industry best practices as we roll out cloud so that we can start to optimize the federal taxpayer dollars and get the results that we, where we hope that we should out of, out of cloud. So I'm excited to do that uh, so we can build a more modern government. And I'm, 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 I'm appreciative of the opportunity to collaborate with such a bright group of individuals. And I'm looking forward to learning more from all of you. Thanks. Great. I mean, so, so great to have you here. And I don't know if you heard in the network in the beginning, but, but Stacey uh, accidentally said how FinOps can help our country. And we were joking about it, but you're actually using FinOps to help our country, which is, which is spot on. Great to have you leading that charge. Thanks, Melvin. Uh, next, Anders Hagman from Spotify. Um, I think he's been one of my favorite speakers of watching him over the years. Um, so Anders, if you could introduce yourself. All right, I'm blushing a bit there, uh, but um, I'm a father and a husband uh, working out of Stockholm here uh, for Spotify as a senior manager within procurement. So it's a little bit of a different lens at it. We report into engineering though. Uh, on the side, I'm an ultra distance runner and I'm a former pro snowboarder. Those things usually people make remember me. So if you want to run or 100 miles or 200 miles, you can ask me how to do that. In the community though, I hope, um, that I will focus on designing like nudges that will make this a, a fair marketplace. Uh, not just aimed both at providers and users. Uh, I think this can mean a lot of things, but uh, my goal is in the end to enable more creation, more innovation. Like this could become an unfair marketplace where like no, low margin industries and like, like music is for example, like they don't really get to play in a fair manner like because they can't control their costs. So that's, the, that's my lens at it, so. Thank you. Thank you, Anders. Um, so we're going to turn the time over to Riley Jenkins, who is the last member that we we're adding to the, the TAC at this time. And Riley um, is from Domo. And I got to say, Riley, uh, you and I share something in common. I am from Utah. So, oh, um, cool. so Riley, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, uh, glad to be here. Glad to contribute. Uh, I've been uh, involved in FinOps, uh, but it wasn't called that for about eight years. Um, I am an engineer um, by day-to-day -day and training, so I, I own a production code base, and I also work on FinOps, and that's actually what I'm uh, very passionate about, uh, attacking FinOps from a, a design and architecture standpoint, in addition to the typical FinOps uh, perspective. Great. Thank you so much. Um, the next, we're going to to the governing board, where we're adding two additional members, um, Natalie Daly from HSBC. I've gotten an opportunity to talk with her a few times. Um, she has an, an impressive um, what, what she's doing at HSBC and I think she'll add tremendous value to the governing board. Natalie. Hi, hello everyone. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Jennifer. So um, yes, I, I too am extremely excited to be joining the team and being part of the governing board. I'm a mother. Um, also, um, and I am currently the COO for the CTO um, in uh, technology in HSBC. So it covers shared services and cloud. Um, I'm also responsible for building um, a, the financial FinOps function within uh, HSBC, which is a financial organization and a rather, um, shall we say, traditional environment. So that's been a challenge in itself. So I do believe the experience of going through that journey, I'll be able to um, add value and be part of uh, driving the organization forward. I'm really excited to, to be focusing more on FinOps. I've found a new love in my day to day which is actually is FinOps, no, it's cheesy, but it has brightened my day. And I do enjoy um, very much when I'm, I'm engaging in that FinOps environment at work. Um, 
I, I'm looking forward also to being part of uh, helping to define the strategy, the direction, um, and how we can uh, expand the FinOps Foundation for both our wider stakeholders and obviously our practitioners. So raring to go, um, really looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Um, I'm hoping Scott's on. Um, Scott Lynn from Chevron. Hey, I'm on. Hey, thanks, uh, Jen. Uh, Scott Lynn from Chevron. I'm actually at the office today, so uh, super excited about that. I haven't been here for a while, um, and I'm super excited about joining the governing board. About a year ago, I started to think, boy, is there anybody else out here kind of doing what I'm doing and stumbled upon the FinOps Foundation? And it's, it's been awesome to be part of, of the group. I've been doing FinOps at Chevron. I started our practice over a little over three years ago um, after helping to lead us into cloud about six years ago. So I'm our cloud services and optimization manager. Uh, responsible for all the services around cloud that get delivered to Chevron and optimization. And then recently we added modernization to my plate. So I'm, I'm loving picking up that. Uh, just, I can't believe I'm, I'm in a group of, of folks uh, that have just been announced and others and uh, just really, you know, FinOps is just so awesome to me. You know, when I come to these meetings, it's the only thing I focus on, which I always multitask at pretty much everything else. So I'm just really excited to, to, to be part of the group, be on the governing board, uh, looking forward to bringing an Azure perspective because we're all in on Azure here. So uh, that, that might be my take and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Um, I, you know, just to wrap up this section, um, I think we're all really excited um, with the, the governing board and the TAC um, to really enrich our community and really focus on enabling you as practitioners. So um, I'm going to say a couple of things. We're going to be um, going entering in our planning session for 2022 for the type of programs that we need to um, fund and also to lift up um, from a practitioner standpoint. Um, and so it's really important that you participate in the survey and give us the feedback so that we make sure that what we're building toward is actually building toward what you need um, from the FinOps Foundation. So JR, I'm gonna turn the time back over to you, I believe. Yes, and I am gonna try to play your, what was meant to be your intro music. We're now having it be your outro music, which uh, Jen requested some, some zombie by the Cranberries. So I didn't get to it in time. So there, there, there's your music. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Jen, and, and everybody. This is like, I'm, I'm, I'm chuffed. I'm sitting here smiling, so happy to hear about the mix of people from different industries and locations. I mean, uh, between Chevron and Spotify, what completely different types of companies, but all working on the same things and in different clouds also between Azure and AWS and GCP. Uh, really fantastic. Um, Anders, you made me feel bad about my, my running. That's, uh, that was pretty impressive what you pull off there. But welcome all to the board. We're also gonna meet a little bit later, um, Michael Kearns from Vertisent, uh, who's joining as a new premier member uh, in a section later. Uh, here's the Tech Advisory Council, fantastic folks uh, who are joining that. Thank you, everybody. We have two more introductions and then we're gonna get into content. Thanks everybody for the patience. There's a lot happening on this one. Um, two new general members, I wanna bring in um, both Yoda Scale and Reflex joined us in the last month and hoping uh, Jeff Harris can do a quick 30 second intro uh, on, on you and, and your company while you're joining and then we'll follow that up with Constantino from Reflex. Great, yeah, thank you, JR. Um, happy to be here, appreciate the uh, opportunity to join the organization. We've been, um, I'm with a company called Yodascale, I'm a product manager there and we are a SaaS software vendor. Um, who, and our mission is to optimize the world's cloud computing spend by empowering engineering teams. Uh, really excited to be part of the community and looking forward to uh, contributing. Thanks for having awesome. us. Thank you, Jeff. Welcome. And Constantino, are you there as well? Hey, I'm here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, hi, guys. Uh, I'm Tino, CTO and co-founder of Replex. Uh, so Replex is the first fully managed SaaS platform for Kubernetes cost and efficiency. Our platform delivers um, real-time data and visibility into uh, Kubernetes cost structures across multi-cloud and on-prem environments. We are a FinOps certified platform and solution provider, and the purpose of us joining the community is really sharing the knowledge that we gained with our customers and learn from other participants of the foundation. Um, we love to have great conversations, so yeah, feel free to ping us on Slack or email. Thank you. 
Thanks, Tina. Yeah, and this is great. What we're working to do here, right, is pull together the three-legged stools of the practitioners doing the work, the vendors who help support them, and then also the consultants who help them build up the practices. So it feels like it's, it's all coming together and glad to have you all here. And with that, the housekeeping is done. I'm gonna take a deep breath, I'm gonna take a little pause, I'm gonna stop the screen share, and we're gonna get into the first of the three segments. Uh, this deep breath is here for us, both to take that pause for the recording, uh, but also to remember that all this FinOps stuff, well, it makes our work fun, hopefully, and it's uh, something you're enjoying doing, you know, is not the most important thing we do. And I love to hear, you know, Natalie bring up that she's a, she's a mother and Anders say she's a father. And um, if you've read the book, we talk about this a bit, like don't let that expiring RI or savings plan, you know, distract you from this important thing. So glad to be on this journey with all of you. And I'm going to stop the screen share uh, and pass to Mr. Rob Martin and Ashley Ramatko, who are going to lead us through the Adopting FinOps section. Actually, JR, I have woke up in the middle of the night, though, remembering that I did not buy an RI. So sometimes oh, it does disturb sleep. sleep. Yeah. I think we thought we were, you were going to keep screen sharing, but uh, we can take over. <laughs> I am happy to do so. Okay. And jump back to Rob for the mentee. So I took that deep breath, so now I'm super calm. Yeah. It matter that so, I stopped screen. Okay. We, if you guys remember last uh, summit, which was like a month ago, um, we talked about creating a new group called Adopting FinOps. So this was a pretty uh, popular request. And so we did kick that off. We're like four weeks into it. And I just want to kind of explain how the working group is uh, working. So we do have a Slack channel that's dedicated to the working group. This is our kind of generic um, Adopting FinOps Slack right there. And we're meeting on Fridays, which this uh, group has a very diverse time zone. So I want to give a big thank you to many people that are coming to meetings very earlier evenings. But we meet for about an hour every Friday. Um, and then we've had a couple breakout sessions as well. And then we've kind of had some homework stuff. So I just want to explain that sometimes, you know, when you think about getting involved with the working group, you know, it's about an hour to two hours uh, with a time commitment a week. So I do want to thank the many people that have been doing that this last four weeks. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Eric Peterson, and he will speak through um, kind of our lighthouse that we have recently um, launched. Great. Thank you, Ashley. Um, so it all began for all of us in many ways with, with a vision that FinOps was at the core of uh, what we were working on and what we were trying to get at. And for me, this journey started a long time ago. Um, for, for all of us, it may have started a long time ago or may have just started yesterday. But when we think about adopting FinOps, we wanna make sure that everyone understands what our shared vision is. And so we sat down to think about that vision and our mission as we started this project. Um, and it's as simple as that, that we see FinOps as something bigger than just saving a few dollars here and there, but actually unlocking this promise that cloud computing has, has really kind of unlocked in our minds for us. And we want to share that, of course, with the world, but most importantly, help organizations adopt FinOps and um, make that a successful, make that journey successful for them. So our mission is to serve you, the community, the FinOps community, the folks that are um, looking for guidance, education, enablement materials that we can provide you with um, uh, the tools in order to bring FinOps into your organizations, whether you're uh, coming from the bottoms up as, a, as an individual contributor, or you're an executive looking to start a, a, um, a FinOps practice within your organization, we want to help guide you with that material. So our mission is to serve you in the community and, and achieve that goal so that we can all be part of this shared vision of FinOps unlocking this promise of cloud computing. So that was our, that was our lighthouse statement in terms of how we started uh, thinking about bringing all this stuff together. And the team has, has done a lot of great work as well to think about the personas and the other parts uh, of this process. So Ashley, back to you. Thanks. And so um, this was probably one of our first deliverables. And then the second deliverable we've been working towards is creating an adoption roadmap for what we're calling the driver persona. So I'll hand it over to Mike to go through that. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. Well said, Eric. Uh, so we've identified in the working group, the working group, by the way, has... Uh, the Slack channel has like 43 people in it. We've had meetings with, uh, you know, 13 or 15 people on them in a single meeting, which is really quite good turnout considering these are volunteers basically. And so we're really actually, I think, getting some good momentum in the working group. And uh, um, we're working on things we think practitioners will need like the persona of the driver and what are the personas of the various stakeholders that that driver will have to interact with. We'll get to that in a minute. And then, uh, and then we've been working on the roadmap. And so, this you know, nice graphic doesn't really do it justice. So I took the liberty of putting a tiny URL 
there in the bottom, adopting FinOps roadmap. That'll take you to the Google Doc where we've been collaborating and taking down notes. And we see certain patterns that you have, you know, like you have to lay down a foundation. So we have a planning phase, socialize, prepare, launch. We all know about run. Uh, that's where we want to get to. The question is, how do you get there? And so in the planning phase, you're uh, identifying your stakeholders and your pain points. Um, you're also getting in, in that stage, you're, you're identifying your first KPIs. These are very useful for painting a vision of where you could be when you get into the run phase and you're creating a communications plan. You go through the socialize stage. This is where you're starting to uh, uh, cultivate champions that you're going to need in, in later phases um, and uh, it, where you establish kind of the operating model of how this is going to play out. Then we go to the prepare phase. This is where you're you know, configuring tools, setting up dashboards, if there's any kind of chargeback and showback functions. But at this point, you're also getting early wins because those uh, sort of are those are leverage that you use from the early phases to achieve more champions and more wins later. And then uh, the launch phase, so you establish your communications plan back in uh, around stage two. So this is where you're executing your communications plan. You established a steer code back around stage two. This is where you're actually you know, getting the cadences going with them and you do a broad based launch. So I only had 60 seconds and that's why I put that link to the tiny URL in there. Cause I'm gonna throw it back to Ashley, but uh, you know, I'm, you know, we've got great people you know, working on this and thinking about this. And you can see in the uh, in this in the Slack channel who's you know who, who's been contributing, and we really appreciate the help. It's been I think really good to identify the the common phases, the common challenges, and the plan is to create more materials around all of this so that you have a walk around deck that you can take to these various stakeholders. Maybe some initial KPIs that you can use to help paint the vision, and so on. So I, I think I'm probably out of my 60 seconds. I'm going to throw it back to uh, uh, the next slide, Ashley. And, Thanks, uh, Mike. Try to hold the time. Perfect. You did great. Yeah. So um, just going to the next slide here. So, um, you know, as much as the driver's going to have the roadmap, they're probably going to need to understand who they're working with. And so I'm going to turn it over to Italise to explain um, where we were going with personas next. Yep. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Italise. So as these discussions progressed, this idea of the FinOps driver, we kind of realized, OK, this is actually more of a bit of a unicorn where you have to collaborate, uh, co collaborate across teams in a broad fashion. So have that common vocabulary or lexicon, however you want to, to put it for all of the various teams, whether it was the executives, the finance teams. So including pro procurement, we heard earlier, the engineering teams, as well as the product teams. So the deliverables and the goals that we wanted to uh, achieve was to have this content and information across each of these personas in order to convince and adopt FinOps. Um, so if you actually go into the next slide, JR, please. Awesome. So what we ended up having and was this first kind of template for these personas. And we said, okay, what are they trying to achieve? What are their motivators and what are their incentives? And then we, can, we started to fill out those goals, those concerns and the messaging per, um, at the time we said, all right, business, tech, finance, what does that look like? Uh, if you go next one more time, you'll see a, an, ex an example of a matrix that we put together as far as, okay, what does that messaging look like for, you know, kind of the champions or the audience? So how would you speak to each of these people? And lastly, the other matrix that we came up with, uh, so one more next, we had a matrix to understand the personas from an accountability. Uh, at first, we weren't sure if we wanted to say responsibility, or we ended up saying D for driver, depends on Every organization is going to want to call it a little bit differently, um, as well as who needs to be informed of what's going on and who needs to have control as to as to what's going on. So I will wrap up by saying the next step, uh, what we're looking to achieve in the next couple of weeks um, and time moving forward with this working group is to develop presentations, short, sweet little presentations in order to drive these interactions and have it scoped to each of the personas so that we can understand the language and understand, you know, how do we want to influence these people and um, develop messaging through that so that there's a higher success rate that FinOps is actually adopted within your organization. So thank you. Perfect. Pass I think with, and Ashley, yeah. Thank you. And I think perfect with all this stuff, I think these are the initial documentations and we'll keep iterating on them. And I think we constantly learn from you guys about your adoption journeys. And so um, I think that at this point, we want to kind of let uh, Natalie step in and share a little bit about her adoption stories. Um, and then we'll have Melvin after that. Hello. 
Can you guys hear me? Yeah? Yes, we can. So. <laughs> okay, great. So uh, my adoption journey, HSBC's adoption journey, I think um, I'll try and um, tie it back to many of the key points that have been raised, but they, I recognise them all. I think um, initially the planning stage uh, for us as HSBC was to wholeheartedly decide to go on that cloud journey. As an organization, without that decision and without that senior commitment, there wasn't really a FinOps conversation to be had. Um, and one of the challenges, once that happened and that maturity settled in, we saw a rapid uptick in um, cloud consumption across multiple vendors. So we have a multi-cloud cloud strategy. And as a result of that, it presented a number of, of challenges for us that were, I suppose, the anchors I used to get that stakeholder buy in or to get that understanding and commitment from the wider organization. Simple things like the inability to manage the level of cloud spend um, on an Excel spreadsheet. We simply ran out of lines. Um, talking about um, basically how we then optimize the growth that we could see whilst um, not really seeing a reduction in um, on-prem costs. So all of those things um, came together and, and basically helped us put forward the proposal around, around FinOps. We had to talk with uh, the business stakeholders around revenue and flexibility. Um, the IT stakeholders were around optimizations, saves, impact in the bottom line, but also um, the engineering community around being actively being part of that and having more autonomy and control at being able to, to deliver those optimizations for utilizing FinOps. Um, we now have, somebody mentioned earlier, uh, champions and uh, racy. So we have a target operating model wrapped around the way that we, we manage um, the FinOps, found, um, FinOps function and the processes that we implement across the, G, uh, the global businesses and global functions. It's a centralized team that works in coordination with all of the businesses, um, technical resources and senior stakeholders. And we now have pockets of champions that um, beyond those that we allocated in the early days to actually drive within the businesses, the adoption, we now have uh, more senior people volunteering to tell our story throughout the organization on steer codes and more senior forums where they discuss strategy and direction. So that has evolved out of, I suppose, building a core team with some clear um, guidance around how we interact with each other and how we present the benefits of what we do. And then has had taken on a life of its own in some ways um, and moved to how we are represented beyond our team in other areas across the bank. And we continually uh, provide um, those outputs and that focus and the uh, narrative and also training and education. So we've started that as well internally to bring those who are impacted closer to what we're doing and therefore uh, enable us to translate all the great outcomes of, of um, our activities and our tactics uh, and what that means to the business and also finance. So initially it was quite a, a a uh, difficult uphill journey, but it's definitely, I think, uh, main, um, gathering momentum and having wider understanding across across a very traditional financial environment. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Natalie. I think we're going to turn it to Melvin to tell, share a little bit of his adoption story next. Yep, I'm here. Just got to get off the mute button. <laughs> So my, my, uh, my journey here with the federal government, we are in what I would consider to be the crawl stage. We're very early in our adoption journey. Uh, the things that we, we wanted to accomplish is based on our, our lessons learned from having done these in previous agencies is our spending gets out of control. And the federal government, unlike industry, we are, our budgets are different. We don't have, uh, I can't raise my prices in order to make up for cost overruns. And that's that's different for us. And so when I get a when I get budget from Congress, it's it's fixed. And so I, I can't I can't afford to have cost overruns on our cloud on our cloud environments. And so we've we've had some that have, have run over real bad. And, and so we couldn't get a, a good handle on our spending. And so 
uh, ran into to JR, ran into the book, and and now we were able to at least start to build the framework uh, from scratch. And so we're starting with a, a brand new cleaner site. We're starting to migrate everything to our, our Azure clouds. And, and so what we're doing now <clears throat> is we're putting all the governance in place, which included FinOps. And that that's the, the, the foundation for what we're doing on the governance side. Uh, we're getting everybody trained. We, we, we've identified, you know, key people within the organization and we're using training um, as the foundation to get everybody in the same language so that we, we're all going in the same direction. And so I believe that training is going to be key for anybody that wants to go forward. You need to get everybody, uh, everybody trained that's going to participate at the outset and getting them um, it, it, to develop a common language. So we're, we're taking that that step. We've already developed the strategy. Uh, we're using the three pillars from the book. And now we're starting to work on a government playbook, uh, which is going to look a little different from industry, but we'll be able to leverage some of the best practices. But we want to uh, lead the way in building a playbook that other government agencies can use uh, as we go forward, highlighting our differences. Uh, we've got a government only Slack channel now. And, and so we're, we're happy about that. And that, that's starting to grow. Uh, but that's that's pretty much where we are. We've got a a con we're starting to write statements of work for vendors and contractors to support us in that effort. So that becomes reusable for other government agencies uh, to use and, and what some of our key metrics will be for success going forward. So that's that's pretty much our journey uh, selling it on the inside of government. So I'm not a big sales guy, so I, I'll be honest with you. I don't I don't go around with a tin cup and a marketing program trying to sell it. Uh, the one thing I did do is I just said, hey, look, we, um, we, we're not getting any more money. And if we don't, don't do FinOps, then we're not going to be successful in our cloud journey. And I just kind of left it at that. Uh, and so from the CFO's perspective, the thing that they wanted to hear was that this is going to be something that's going to help us to manage our costs and get us to a more mature charge back and show back. And that was just putting it in their language was what was helpful to them. And so thank you. Thank you. That's amazing. That's one of my favorite things is no matter the industry you're in, we're all facing the same problems and kind of come up with the same solution. So it's great to hear that uh, about your journey. Um, next thing I want to do is switch over to Menti. So I believe uh, Rob has put this inside of the chat. Um, so while we were working in our adoption group, there was a couple questions that kept coming back to us and kind of had different perspectives about it. And we thought it'd be really useful to hear from the community. I'm happy to see over 500 people on the call today. So if you could go to menti.com um, and put in the code um, and start answering this question within your organization, was FinOps born from a top down or a grassroots approach? And if it was grassroots, what type of grassroots? So we have, it was an executive mandate, top down, engineering sold it to management, grassroots, Finance sold it to management, grassroots. Someone else sold it to management, grassroots. So please take a few minutes to answer, give it a couple of seconds, and then we will show results and discuss. I've never had a mentee with this many people in it before, so I'm hoping for the best. Let's Hopefully, you don't break it, right? <laughs> look at the. Look at that, the engineers are being the most cost conscious. I love that. Yeah. Riley's smiling over there, I'm sure. I know he sold it to his org. Yeah, so how we kind of incorporate this into the working group is also realizing that um, what we create for a driver, we can't assume that personality of that driver, we can't assume that role that they're coming from. And so being kind of agnostic to the fact that that, that, um, that person persona that's the driver maybe coming from a different area of the business is really important for us. That's really interesting. I'm curious if anybody uh, was in these sold it, who, who sold it? Rob, I missed what you said there. From I just, I'm just curious who are all these others who are selling to management uh, were from. That would be an interesting thing. We're going to have to run another survey. Yeah, I think uh, uh, join, please, any of you who voted for the last one, please join the, the Adopting FinOps Working Group and, and uh, share with us. Okay. Um, this is Maggie. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so I, at least from my perspective, for engineering sold it to management. I know you're talking about someone else, but I just want to make a comment about engineering. I know that uh, engineering sold it because management was asking about forecasting. And without FinOps, how do you, you know, how do you, effectively forecast and you know optimize 
So that was the driver behind engineering, selling it to management. Really interesting. Thanks. All right, we'll pivot to the last mentee question we have for you guys all today. Hey, Ashley and Rob, just as a placeholder for later, it would be great. Maybe we should consider sending this link out in the Slack and email and get even more data for it. Because I think we could really build on this over time. Uh, we'll yeah, do that. That's a good point. Hey, if you're watching the, the, the chat, we might need to add some more categories. <laughs> All right, next question I want to ask is um, really why did your, your organizationally additionally adopt FinOps? So not necessarily why are you doing FinOps right now, but why did you initially adopt? And so we want to understand if it was um, a driver was cost savings um, to create value or quality and operational saying? resistance. Hey, Ignacio, how are you? So you can do the same thing as you're going to hey. go to the mentee. Uh, so, yes. Yeah, so quick on the mute. I don't think that was related. <laughs> I, I, I got you covered with the mute. <laughs> All right. We're, we're both muting. Luckily, Zoom, Zoom brings the uh, person speaking to the top of the list. There we go. Boom. Okay. 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 I did just mute the entire call. So actually, Rob, you have to unmute yourselves again. Okay, this, this is one. this is pretty good. This I think this correlates to a lot of what we were discussing too. You know, initially when you adopt, the trigger does seem to be um, we've got to save money. We're going over budgets. You know, we've seen the statistics about eighty percent of cloud cloud is going to go over budget next year. So um, that does correlate a lot to what we've seen. Um, I'm curious if anybody would want to uh, dive a little bit more on the create value, whether it's in the the chat channel of you know what was that value you were trying to create. Be interesting to look at one as well to see if uh, if save cost was the initial adoption cell, how that evolved over time, right? For the more run stage people, if that maintained as the primary one, or if it moved into the others based on stage. Yeah, that's a good call out. I like the TCO moving um, moving to on prem, so trying to create value. May not be able to save money when you're moving right away, but understand the value. It's a great one. All right, awesome. Um, I don't know where we're at for time. I love the idea. So we'll post the Menti uh, link just so we can get capture some other inputs. Um, I think the last slide we just have here is just how to get involved. So we're in week four. We are going to ideally do another four weeks. Um, we mentioned the roadmap, the personas, and next up for us is really trying to put together some content for that driver. So I have two calls of for action. Um, first one is if you've done a presentation or you've pitched your adoption and you have some of that slide material that you feel like you can pull enough of your company data out and share with us, we really appreciate those slides um, being posted onto the Slack channel that will just allow us to kind of see, well, what needs to go into a pitch? Do we need to put ROI into it? Do we need to put the, where the state of their spend is now? So we want to get some insights from you. If you've pitched it before, what did you put into it? So either share some of your slide decks or even go ahead and post out in that channel. Like, don't forget that you're going to need to pitch this, right? Um, the second way you can get involved is, like I said, we're meeting on Fridays. Our next meeting is tomorrow. It's 12 p.m. Central. Um, 11 p.m. Central, I'll take that back. So go ahead and join the channel and let myself or Tracy or Rob know that you're interested in getting involved and we'll have you pulled into the conversation. Even though we've started, don't feel like you can't jump right in. We can have you um, read the material. Um, and like I said, we've got the next big deliverable that we could definitely use some help with. I think of Jeremy, I'm going to turn it back to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, so you all have definitely upped the bar. I guess we call you bar raisers if we're using the Amazon term uh, in terms of working groups. I think that's the first time we've had a mission and vision. Uh, great to see that also aligned really closely to the overall uh, FinOps Foundation mission and vision. Uh, so yeah, this is a great example of a working group that is you know building and growing that I think will be going on you know for hopefully a long time and a great way for any of you to get involved, um, obviously with this one, you know, if you want to participate or some of the upcoming ones. Um, little highlight, yes, we are we are a bit behind on time, but the, the conversation has been so good. Uh, we have a little time we're going to flex at the end. One of the things I do want to focus on, we're going to pass in a second here to uh, Vasilio Marconastasakis, Vaz, from our team to talk about is what we're really looking to do as part of the Linux Foundation integration last year uh, as we grow is not just have these calls where we talk about great things and share best practices, but all of this work the working groups are doing is feeding into the FinOps framework as a, as a living, breathing document for all of that. So I'm going to pass to uh, Vaz here 
to tell a little bit about updates there. There's some new materials also that came out uh, just this morning as related to this. Hey, thanks, JR. Uh, just going to echo what you said. I love that adopting. Uh, FinOps working group, uh, some great work there, and and also uh, a great segue into the topic of the framework. Um, someone mentioned earlier the the notion of nudging. Uh, so in in that vein, um, let's talk a little bit about the framework and how we're nudging it along. Um, we are continuing uh, to work at investing in the framework, as Jared mentioned, building it out, firming up the concepts, creating some structure, and most import importantly, creating context so that it's helpful for our member practitioners. Um, and on that note, what you'll notice is some updates to the website. So the first update JR has on the screen here, um, you know, our FinOps infographic poster, which, uh, you know, encapsulates sort of the framework in a picture. Uh, or at least the main areas or the main concepts. So we've got a refresh look and feel. Uh, we've added links to the image uh, so that you can link back to the major topics in the framework as we build the framework out um, and add more content there. Uh, and then, you know, most importantly, um, you know, making it easier to access the framework, eventually what you're looking at here will be sort of the portal or the gateway into the framework. It'll be the landing page. Um, so you can take a peek at the updated uh, poster uh, at finops.org uh, when you have a moment. And JR, if you'd like to go to the next slide. Um, and then, so speaking of firming up the framework, you know, we're reaffirming some of the foundational concepts, right? So trying to tie things together, as I mentioned, create some structure. So you'll notice now uh, the left uh, nav on the finops.org has been cleaned up a little bit uh, with the main concepts that we're going to be working on. Um, specifically, I like to call out sort of uh, life cycle. Uh, we've kind of renamed that to phases. It still uh, represents the life cycle of FinOps, but rather than um, implying sort of there's a start, beginning, and an end, as you all know, or those who have been doing FinOps, uh, FinOps is a is a continuous uh, a process, uh, something that you need to revisit um, depending on which capabilities you're working on. So um, the other change is uh, introducing the concept of domains, which represents spheres of knowledge. And then finally, um, introducing the concept of capabilities, which are effectively functional activities uh, in support of uh, the, the corresponding domain. Concepts will belong to uh, one or more domains are grouped under. So there's that context that I mentioned earlier. And then they're intended to be in service of uh, our practitioner uh, enablement, right? Whether that's education, whether that capability is knowledge sharing, whether it's actually um, uh, meeting business objectives uh, or improving your FinOps, overall FinOps maturity. So that's kind of directionally where we're headed there. And then just let's dive a little bit deeper into domains. So uh, if you look at the website today, you'll notice a refresh page for domains, uh, effectively the six uh, spheres of knowledge, if you will, under which we'll, we'll be collecting um, and organizing capabilities. Uh, things to call out here, uh, we also want to enable our practitioners, so making it easy to access information. Uh, so we'll include things like cross-referencing to training, we'll include things like cross-referencing to service provider and uh, platform vendors, uh, so you all can uh, have uh, information at your fingertips. And then finally, just a little bit of a teaser on what we're kind of still working on, uh, building out sort of this concept of capability. So again, adding some structure, encapsulating things like measures of success, um, encapsulating things like maturity level, what the functional activities are for, for capabilities. And um, you know what we're gonna be looking for is uh, help from the community. Uh, so uh, coming soon, we'll probably be kicking off uh, working groups uh, similar to the Adopting uh, FinOps Working Group, where folks can come together and start helping us um, frame up these uh, capabilities and add content. Uh, items of note for the capabilities, uh, again, under the um, concept of enabling our practitioners, uh, we'll be looking to include things like FinOps Story, so you can hear from real-world experience, folks that, that have kind of uh, implemented a capability or worked on in a particular domain. And then again, you'll be able to, for a particular capability, look at, you know, are there any tooling or service providers that can that can help you beyond what we already have on finops.org. Um, I think that's oh, one more, JR. And then on that note, if you go to the next slide, 
uh, as I mentioned, uh, we'll be looking for your help. So as always, uh, whether it's uh, work that's coming, as I mentioned, with the capabilities or work that's already posted, um, please contribute. Um, you know, help make the content better. You can use um, multiple options for, for contributing to uh, improve overall content and suggesting new content. Uh, if you're comfortable with GitHub, you can use GitHub, but we've also got a Google form uh, for folks that uh, would prefer just to use a regular document uh, and you can submit requests or um, uh, improvements. Um, and of course, uh, the Slack channel. And then finally, we'd like to do a quick shout out. Uh, this is great top contributors. Uh, since the last member summit. Uh, big community thank you for our top contributors, uh, Stephen Arthur, I'm not sure if you're on the call, and Kevin Sliffer, if uh, you're on the call, but thanks so much. Uh, really appreciate um, the content that you contributed, and Kevin, thanks for fixing our spelling mistakes too. So I think that's it from a framework perspective, JR. What's the uh, next slide? Uh, I think we're going to talk about multi-cloud working group. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, Vaz, for that overview. And as you'll see, what we're trying to do, and, and Vaz has really been leading the charge here since he just joined us last month full time to really get more structure around this, uh, a better repeatable process um, for this that you're all feeding into the website. Uh, yes, this will be updating to the question in chat into all the training. Uh, the framework is really meant to be the center, the core of the best practices that feed the training, that feed when we do book ups, updates that feed you know these calls, it's also the, the place where we catch all the content, right? Where these things would be collected. Um, also want to give a shout out to Mike Fuller uh, at Atlassian, who's been working very closely with Vaz uh, on this. Uh, he unfortunately, time zones does not work for these calls, uh, but he's been a big, big part of making this happen as well. So with that, uh, I think you've asked, gonna pass over to uh, Kim Weir from Target for a short update from the formerly called GCP uh, working group, but now multi-cloud as it really applies to, to all of them. Hopefully Kim is here, maybe not. Bess, do you mind giving a quick rundown on, on what they've been yeah. doing? Hold on, she, she's here. She just said okay. she can't unmute. <laughs> oh, so no. here, hold on. I just gave her the permission. Kim, you should be able to do it. There we go. All right, there we go. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was like, no, I can't unmute. I can't, I'm here. So here I am. Um, so we've come and talked about the multi-cloud working group before. Um, as uh, JR mentioned, it was formerly known as the GCP working group. Um, what our original goal was really to make sure that the FinOps content had a balanced representation across cloud service providers. Um, our, four working, our four work streams were really looking at the FinOps content, so the FinOps, pract FinOps practitioner course materials, the exam. Um, we did that. We looked through that, made sure that there was kind of parity across the cloud service providers, gave that feedback to Rob. Um, we created a taxonomy and a glossary of terms. So if you're new to FinOps um, and you have one cloud service provider, um, the material may call something one thing. Um, this, uh, this taxonomy or glossary of terms will let you actually um, know how, what is that called in another cloud service provider. Um, we created a tools matrix that, um, that talks about or shows what are the different tools available from each cloud service provider um, to help you in your FinOps practice. Um, so things like looking deeper into your billing or um, looking at forecasting before you jump in. Um, and then we um, reviewed the Google FinOps white paper. So the outcome really, we have now added a, um, a page to the project section of the finops.org website that has all of this multi-cloud working group information in it. The, um, the taxonomy glossary of terms and the tools matrix aren't there yet, but uh, there's places um, holding spots for that information. Um, and Boz is going to get that information out there so it's available. Um, and we we will kind of wrap up this working group now, um, but as other needs arise, um, we will tackle different um, problems to make sure there's always that parity across platforms. So that's it. I've got a surprise for you here, Kim. If, yeah, if you go to the next slide, the project page is up. So multi-cloud tools and terminology is on the finops.org website and- Oops. Whoops. 
my bad. I, I clicked a link behind the scenes and broke it all. No, no worries. I'll and be- um, we go. as as we mentioned a moment ago, um, you know, please contribute if you'd like to get involved in this working group or other working groups, or just propose uh, content or updates. Um, every page has a propose edits button, and uh, uh, our our goal here is to have a member driven. Uh, best practices and a grassroots uh, con- contribution model. So please, uh, please join the conversation. Thank you, Kim and and Baz and uh, all the folks at, at Google who helped uh, get this going as well. Um, really great to see the working group come together, launch some stuff, uh, and we're now starting to represent. Uh, we have a lot of questions about which groups are running and what's the status and where do I get plugged in. If you go to finops.org uh, under the project section on the left, there's an overview now that lists out the active, incubating, paused, et cetera, working groups. Uh, this right now has a link to the relevant Slack rooms for each of these. So that's the best place to get started. We're going to be adding over time materials and you know leads, additional info to this. But there's now finally one true source for all this. So please jump in there. Uh, this group will be moving uh, you know, from an active. It's now going to a paused state. Happy to unpause it when we have more need, more demand, when someone puts their hand up and says, hey, we need to fix this, we'll restart the working groups as well. <clears throat> and with that, back to the concept of uh, walk-on music. I actually remember this one, unlike Jen's, we're gonna bring in a little DJ Cool from the 90s to bring on Mr. Joe Daly to talk about waste reduction. Joe, are you there? I'm sure he's hitting that same mute issue. Yes, we need to Joe we muted everybody so we have to allow me. them. Yeah, hold on, Joe. We'll get you. Yeah, okay. Got you, Joe. There we go. <clears throat> All right, JR, there's music in my monitors. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Joseph Daly. Uh, I am a member of the TAC as well as uh, Director of Cloud Optimization Services at Nationwide. Uh, I've done it a few other places as well. I'm here to introduce the waste reduction uh, working group, uh, as well as introduce our new premier members, uh, Vertisent, and get some uh, chat talking with uh, Andrew Britton, who brought up a really great related Slack conversation. So he's going to share a story here at the end. Uh, JR, can you can you be my uh, mouse clicker? Um, thank you. So. Last month, uh, in a fit of mid 2000s nostalgia, I started my own blog. I think it's going to do big things, uh, blogging. Um, so it's called FinOps Playlist. Uh, I talk about two things I really enjoy talking about FinOps. Love hearing all our governing board and new tech members talk about how excited they get about talking about FinOps. I'm the same way. I uh, like writing about it and I like choosing blogs out of the future. Thanks, Phil Purcell. Uh, I like choosing playlists, uh, so I do the same thing. One of my topics was the two types of optimization opportunities uh, I see on a frequent basis um, every, just all the time. So usually there's a gigantic uh, optimization opportunity, that your, your mountains, those are filled with value. Emoji face, just throwing up dollar signs. Uh, those are huge things, and they're not easy to go for. You need teamwork, collaboration, lots of effort, um, but they're usually very worth the, very worth the effort, uh, depending on scenario. There's also tiny, tiny molehills that if you address individually and say, hey, if you could right-size this or you could turn it off, you know, you'll save 20 cents a month. And usually the engineers will look at you, give you a dollar and say, go away, never bother me again. Um, however, molehills don't just go away on their own. In fact, they propagate. They show up all over the place if you don't take care of them. Uh, so JR, if you could do the mouse clicking to the next slide. Um, how do you handle moles, molehills? Because if you don't take care of them, they're going to go everywhere and you won't be able to take a step without stepping in a molehill, ruining all your plans going towards those mountains. So don't, uh, don't be a Carl Spangler and go after each mole and I know I know in Caddyshack, it's a gopher, um, but stick with my analogy for me. Uh, Don't be Carl Spangler going nuts, trying to kill every gopher mole manually. Do it. You remove that with automated compliance. Um, So what you do is you go to that engineer who gave you a dollar to go away and never talk to them again and say, hey, 
could you automate the fix for me? And they can't help themselves. They have to automate things. So they will automate your scheduled compute shutdowns. They will automate abandoned storage volume termination. Uh, they will make sure your snap, snapshots and backup retention policies are in place. Multi-part uploads in your S3 buckets will get deleted uh, and tagging compliance. They will not like that they have to tag, but if you say, can you script the ability, the enforcement of making people tag, they will feel conflicted, but they will also automate that for you. Um, so once you have these automations in place, the uh, basically take care of all your molehills. You'll have to monitor it to make sure that the scripts are still working because they will break. But all of a sudden your yard, instead of having molehills, gophers, moles sticking their heads up out of everything, ruining all of your cloud spends and giving you death by a thousand paper cuts on all these little things, nits and gnats, um, you have, it's taken care of automatically and you can focus on those mountains in the distance. Uh, where all the value is. And that's where, that's where everyone, all, when you can start doing transformations, uh, moving to containers, moving to cloud native services, re-architecting solutions uh, to help drive the business forward and create more revenue for your teams. Um, now, just because I wrote a blog, doesn't mean that is the only thing, uh, or that is the only way to do it. Um, there's other alter, there's other scenarios, there's other viewpoints of how to do it. Um, I'm gonna hand this over to Vertisent here next. Um, I like how they took my analogy and, and just flipped it a little bit, uh, kind of got in, in different orders. I say, I'm saying, you know, it's beneficial to take over those mole hills first, then go after the mountains. But I really like what uh, Michael and Mel are gonna present uh, about different, slightly different take on it. So let me hand it over to, to them, Michael, Mel. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. Um, I realize that we have, uh, most of them have matching LinkedIn mountain themes. We're both in Colorado, though she's in Panama at the moment. Um, hello, Michael Kern, founder and CEO of Vertisent. I'm um, actually, you can switch slide. Yep. Um, not going to talk about us, but actually talk about our heritage a bit, which is a bit interesting. So, so we come from one of the world's largest private software companies. And we've been working with, we're one of AWS's first customers, and we've been working in the public cloud since, since it started in 2006. And so a lot of what we do as a company is born from all the problems we had to solve as kind of a large private software company with thousands of products that we manage every day and 100,000 cloud accounts, et cetera. But we learned a lot. And I'm actually going to tell a story about how we started to approach managing waste and managing spend for some of our own products you know, as, as we were trying to figure this out ourselves. So you can go to the next slide. Um, and kind of continuing with the, the mountains and molehill analogy, and I think I got the drawing right, hopefully, Joe. Um, and so, you know, we look at it, it's kind of the same concepts, but slightly differently, which is, you know, and I'll use an example. So, you know, some of you may be familiar with, we, we actually purchased a software company called Jive. So thousands of customers, millions of end users. And, you know, we looked at, well, how do you, there's tons of waste in infrastructure. So how do you attack that? And, and we look at it generally as, you know, you've got your big mountains. So big drivers of value that kind of unlock both value, but additional opportunities, molehills. And so, right. So the first thing we did is move it to the cloud and that unlocked a ton of value in a lot of different ways, but it also started to allow us to do things like, you know, discounting reservations, instant sizing. So things that, kind of individually or small, but add up because right, dollars are made of pennies. And so, you know, a hundred thousand, hundred dollar opportunities to save money is a lot of money, not individually, but in whole. So we started to automate those things. And then you say, okay, I've gotten that one mountain out of the way and then a bunch of molehills, what's next? Move the cloud native services. So start to take advantage of kind of economies of scale and efficiencies and kind of natural cloud services. So one is go from kind of expensive data, like, right, paid database to cloud native database. So we did that and that unlocks a bunch of other things like you can move storage types and tiers, like depending on what kind of storage you use, consolidation again, again, kind of mountain unlock both drives a bunch of value on its own, but then unlocks all these other things. And, and again, as Joe said, and automate everything you can because kind of taking someone's time for a hundred dollar opportunity maybe doesn't make sense, but if you can automate it and you can do a thousand of them with the push of a button makes a ton of sense. 
Um, and then you can get into even more advanced things. So in our case, in this one, we went to Kubernetes. That unlocks a whole nother set of things like Spotification, ISG tuning, et cetera, that you can do automatically. But again, you unlock value just by doing the mountain and then it frees up a bunch of molehills. And so for us, you know, we tend to look at it iteratively so that, you know, you can both drive value in chunks, control risk because you're not changing everything, but then you also get the big value up front. But then, you know, there's a ton of stuff that falls out of that and is unlocked behind it. And that's how, for instance, in this instance for, for Jive, that's how we approach it, which is we moved it to the cloud with the cloud native storage and some other things, then moved to Kubernetes. And, you know, when it's all said and done, um, you know, we were able to drive a ton of values, infrastructure costs down by 70%, um, operational costs down by 80%, but SLAs, so responsiveness actually improved. And it's, it's through this mechanism that, that we were able to drive that value. And that, this is so kind of a spin on, Joe's Joe's take of mountains and molehills, but again, but as Joe said, the key is for the molehills, you can't ignore them, but you know, to to take advantage of them truly, you need to automate them. And well, so and Ma Michael, what I like about your slide is, and it's it's kind of something I didn't think about, is after you tackle each of those mountains, you're you're finding new molehills. You're totally. turning mountains into molehills. That's yeah, absolutely. And so, right, because if you just do the mountain, then there's a ton of like eventually the molehills creep up and combine to the size of the mountain again, eventually. Right. And that's where and I'm sure people, I didn't think to go into this, but like you've seen the, you know, clouds more expensive than hosted stuff that's going around. And I think part of the situational truth of that can be like, you can let it get out of control. And some of that out of control is just a bunch of molehills, right? One day you wake up and you've got a hundred thousand molehills and that's a lot. Um, so with that, I'll, I'm going to hand it over to Melissa Lorton, who's a member of our team, just to kind of to, to tie it together and, and kind of how we generally think about it and approach it, you know, even for our own our own applications um, to, to help kind of manage waste in this in this capacity. So, Mel. Thanks, Michael. So going on to the next slide, if we can. This largely pairs with the FinOps lifecycle as a whole. So when we talk about uh, mountains as well. We're talking about just getting that first increment to the cloud, huge, huge mountain in itself. And then really playing off of the concepts in the FinOps of inform, optimize, operate. And through our experience, we also believe that one of the most key pieces is tying back to the original um, adoption pieces within this presentation is making sure that we're giving visibility and driving adoption. And that adoption could be certainly from the executive persona. Um, we have clients that come from the finance persona as well, but certainly at the end of the day, the engineers are the individuals who know the applications best, are able to, to make sure that you're maintaining performance, um, SLAs, making sure that there aren't outages. So always balancing those, but knowing at the end of the day, we believe that data is king. So whether again, it's reporting into those executives, whether it's into your engineers, um, but really through this life cycle, key is enabling those engineers with the data. Um, very much of the DevOps and agility bents, making sure that we're empowering the engineers so that Joe, whether it is that mountain and they understand the effort that it takes or whether it is the smaller molehills, getting the initial adoption out there, knowing that business and technical requirements change, constantly, constantly improving, looking at the data, getting new insights. Um, we also look at driving adoption, for example, through gamification that we've talked about on FinOps before. Um, so at the end of the day, your engineers are problem solvers, enable them, give them data, drive the adoption, make it fun, and continuously improve. So moving Thank you. along, JR. And Mel, one of the uh, uh, I just got a, I just got a message, and it was a really fantastic call out. Is that all these automations and all these tackling of optimization opportunities? We shouldn't do them in a in a silo. You know, th those should be done like by your centralized FinOps team, governing board, CBO, whatever it is, is that centralized oversight um, to spread it out through the enterprise and and uh, automate at scale. So. 
By all means, and making sure, frankly, that they have, if, if it is done in some individual silos, making sure that the engineers have the ability to give visibility and celebrate those wins. Again, whether it's gamification or any of your standard um, communication change management channels, because it really does bolster that feeling of contribution and accelerates innovation. Um, so they could be also done in the silos, but then brought up and, and scaled to larger wins as well. Absolutely, that's awesome. Um, I'm, I'm also feeling that there was a miss, uh, missed opportunity with um, walk up music or walk out music uh, to play some Van Halen Panama for Mel, um, but maybe next time. So uh, with that, let's switch over to a practitioner story. Andrew Britton from Citrix uh, started a fantastic Slack chat. Love how we grab from Slack uh, for, for our summits um, and going to invite him to unmute if able and uh, share his story. Already, uh, more importantly, before already. you hit, you start, though, we, uh, let me bring in your, uh, your walk on Van Halen. It's all right. All right, Andy, how are you? <laughs> okay, if we can move to the next slide. Um, I'll, you know, uh, what we were talking about and, and what Joe mentioned about the small, you know, the mole hills first, that's actually how, how we adopted it in, in Citrix. That's how we looked. You know, uh, 12 months ago, we, we started, we had no vision into our costs, our cloud costs. So that was one of the first things we needed to do. We needed to see what our cloud cost was to identify what the where the largest costs were, were occurring. And as most, uh, and Rob touched on it earlier on in the chat, most of our cost is, is, in, the, is in the VMs, you know, the, the actual EC2s, VMs, all in the compute cost. So what we did to, to look at this is we got the early engagement from and buy-in from our engineering teams. And the way we achieved this is by doing the small mole hills. So we looked at the, you know, the, the EBS volumes, the uh, managed desks. One of the other ones which we, we got the engineers to work on was looking at moving. You know, we look at uh, right sizing and we shutting down instances, VM utilization, but we don't automatically look and say, are we on the latest version of that instance? So we looked at the latest version of the instances, went across all the regions and, and did a comparison as to what we could save by just moving to the latest, the latest version. Uh, you know, and we made some significant savings and it's the engineers who actually uh, undertook that work. So we got the buy-in from the engineers. They saw the benefit that they were generating um, to the company. So they automatically started to buy in and started to, to get engaged with us, which is what one of the key things that, that my team has been working on is the engagement of the engineers. Um, we use tools that are available from you know, the cloud providers. So we use those tools, but it, you have to have a tool available for your vision. Um, and then we've, we've looked, once we've got the quick wins, we've looked at our reservations and our compute saving plans. And we talked to our cloud providers on a regular basis. We also have uh, meetings with our engineering team once a week. We, we have a forum where we discuss with the engineers what, um, what efficiencies they're working on so that all the other engineers can learn from it and actually adopt the ideas that come in there. Um, one of the things that we learned by talking to the cloud providers as well is that we've undertaken compute savings plans on the AWS side, but we weren't aware until they pointed it out that RDS, if you're doing RDS as well, you've got RDS in there, that you need to still undertake your reservations because the, the EC2 instances that your RDS boxes are sat on don't actually you know, uh, come into your compute savings plans. So we actually had to look at reservations on that also. Um, you know, and once we've completed all the quick wins, we've got those out of the way, we, we're starting now to work with the teams. Now we've built up that engagement with them to look at the, the uh, more architectural uh, type of work that we have to do. And what we have to do with that is we have to provide them with the business benefit, you know, and the cost benefit. So we, we undertake the cost benefit analysis to, to identify because we don't want things in place um, that won't won't benefit by the time a product is going end of life. And um, we also have 
budgets that we operate with the teams. So we we set budgets for you know um, in their production and staging environments. So they have budgets set in there, and we set alerting on that so that um, nothing focuses the engineering teams more than than their VP getting a, an alert that they're going over budget for the month. So they focus heavily on their costs. Um, I could run through for, for hours talking about other things that we look at, et cetera. Um, really keen about driving costs down. We, we've got a target in Citrix that we have to achieve. Um, and yeah, we're working towards it. We've had great success with the engineering teams um, and with my team uh, identifying the savings. We've got a lot more to identify, um, but yeah, working through. So Andy, that what, was... What... I, I, what I really like is that you took the next step. You didn't just solve the issue. You took the next step and built operations and alerting uh, on top of that for, 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 for progress, for continuing progress. Um, it's one of the things that the engineering teams like to see as well. They like to have that alerting and know how much they're spending. It's become almost a competition amongst our engineering teams to, to see who can get the best savings. So it does our work for us. It's fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you for yeah, sharing. Andy, thank you for that. And just as a, as a call out to some previous work from a few months back, you know, that, that issue of get, uh, getting competition going and gamification was one of the key themes in the uh, Getting Engineers Take Action working group, uh, actually. And uh, sorry, <laughs> too many names. Riley from Domo, who just joined the TAC, was key in that. So, you know, definitely folks interested in gamification, engineering action, check out the FinOps.org project in that area. Uh, and with that, I think, um, Joe, Michael, Mel, Andy, anything else on this section before we move on? Oh, yes, of course, the how to get involved. Joe, you want That's to right. it? If you want to party like we do, if you want to party with us, uh, get involved with the Reducing Waste Working Group. Uh, I'll share it from the TAC. Um, we're going to rope my, Mel or Michael in for Vertisent to be the tech leads in there and uh, join the working group reducing waste room in Slack uh, listed there. Or email Tracy at FinOps. If you have any questions about the FinOps Foundation, just go ahead and email that uh, email address. I don't think Tracy sure. agreed to that for the call. but uh, Well, she's on great. mute. So. <laughs> you can also um, email membership at FinOps.org if you have questions. And for those of you also with the working group uh, format that you don't know, what we do is a chair each time, and that chair has to be a practitioner, somebody like Joe, who's not a vendor working in the space. And then we couple them with what we call tech leads, uh, who typically can be vendors or can be anybody who really just uh, helps and supports that in the same way that Ashley was the chair of Adopting FinOps and uh, Michael from Accenture was the tech lead. So looking again to get that mix of voices in the conversation. This one's just kicking off. So next time, next month, uh, we're going to have uh, these folks come back with a few key participants, as you saw with the first working group at the top of this call, to share some of what they found, what they're focused on. Frankly, I'm really interested to see where this group goes. I was a big foot dragger in launching this working group because it was one of the top challenges from the state of FinOps, but it's such a massive thing to conquer, right? Prioritization is where this conversation started. Do we get into usage reduction? Do we get into rate reduction? There's a lot to do there. So put your hand up with your interest uh, in that area. Little self-care reminder here before we go on, take a sip of coffee or water or wine for the Europeans where it's five or 6 p.m. And let's talk about a quick update on education before we get into our last segment on data transfer. Awesome, I'll do this real quick. This is always a exciting one for me. Um, so we are celebrating International FinOps Day, folks. So all of our self-paced training, so that includes our FinOps certified practitioner training and FinOps for engineers. For, so those of you that have wanted to take that training, we're offering 25% off of those up until August 20th. That's the last day. Just use the code FinOpsDay21 at checkout. So please remember to do that. I also posted this in Slack, so you can go back and uh, look at this. But um, we have scheduled out all of our instructor-led training throughout the end of the year. Um, so please take a look at the schedule online at finops.org slash certification to see what trainings, if you want to do an instructor-led training. The next one is August 24th and 25th. This is um, uh, uh, APAC, like Australia, New Zealand friendly. It's starting at 6 p.m. Eastern. 
So it's a late one for Rob and I, but uh, for, for folks that are on the West Coast or in other regions, this is a really great one for you to attend. And that is next week. So thanks. That's what I've got. Stacey, I was almost wondering if the dog was a virtual background and then. Oh, is he up? Oh, God. <laughs> it's so great. He, uh, you know, he matches the, the, the couch thing back there. I didn't even know he had hopped up there during the call. Bonus points for, for live background. Yeah. <laughs> uh, great. So uh, first two groups we talked about working groups. We tend to also do a third conversation on these calls that uh, probably isn't going to turn into a dedicated working group. We, we put the Slack link up there for the other working group because uh, this is really a part of that. You know, how do you start to reduce waste? Um, this conversation came out of like a lot of these Slack. There was a conversation. I think this was in the AWS room where, uh, gosh, who was it? It was Andrew Sledge from Cox posted a Cloudflare article about uh, what was termed uh, egregious uh, data egress charges by one of the cloud providers. And I actually really liked in the spirit of, you know, be respectful, share best practices. The conversation went from this, hey, let's get angry at X and Y, you know, cloud providers about their data egress to actually be like an interesting conversation about data transfer, how it is something that requires special types of planning, how it's hard to forecast, uh, and particularly for streaming companies, how it's such a critical part of their FinOps process, both in terms of scale, uh, and that it doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing, right? More streaming, uh, more data transfer, et cetera. Um, so bring in a few of the folks that you met earlier, uh, and I think one or two new ones uh, to share a little bit about this. Uh, Vaz is gonna, gonna help moderate this. Vaz, anything else you saw that was interesting in the Slack conversation or the points you're curious to hear from these folks as we get into the conversation? Yeah, so so um, Jr. Thanks for kind of teeing everything up there. I think um, uh, you know, generally speaking, getting a handle on data transfer, ingress, and egress traffic flows is challenging enough. But now consider the additional layer of complexity, having to account and attribute those costs back to the business. Um, I think this panel um, is 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 going to have a um, some some great thoughts for us to share. Um, and other than what you've already mentioned, I would say, you know, some of the questions we're hoping to tackle with the discussion in this segment is, you know, how do you effectively manage your data transfer spending? How do you find opportunities for optimization? I know there was a post earlier uh, by Alex Hulla. Thanks for that post, Alex, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the members call Slack channel. Um, and then how do you deal with hybrid environments? So, you know, if you still have some on-prem uh, uh, infrastructure as well as you're migrating to the cloud, what considerations do you need to take um, uh, for, for, for managing data transfer costs? So uh, maybe we can kickstart the panel discussion by, you mentioned uh, a lot of the folks that you've, we've already met them, but maybe we can kick kickstart the panel discussion off by meeting one of our panelists, uh, Teresa from EA. Uh, Teresa, if you're on, would, would you mind uh, introducing yourself? Yep, hi, I'm here. Um, hi everyone, um, I'm Teresa. I'm the go-to technical to financial translator for electronic arts. Um, gaming and FinOps has been my passion for the last 13 years and supporting the creation of great video games and translating the technical requirements to support our online players into financial data is where I focused my attention for the last eight of those 13 years. Um, maybe you've heard um, of one of our new uh, releasing games this year, Battlefield 2042. I'm currently in the process of modeling all of our infrastructure spend, data transfer included, um, for this title in the run up to launch in October. I also did that modeling for Need for Speed Heat and for Battlefront 2. And Battlefront 2 is actually where we're going to talk about today. Um, my work on this title um, is our data transfer story. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. All right, so almost five years ago, um, we came up with this great solution to reducing our on-prem costs um, and moving all of our gaming servers for Battlefront 2 to cloud. Um, but what we didn't take into consideration was that data transfer was not included in um, the costs of moving to cloud. Data transfer is an a la carte offering for our cloud providers. Um, when you operate on on-prem servers, as most of you know, data transfer is just a built-in cost um, of either the server costs or the space costs, depending on whether you're leasing or if you own those, those servers. And with that, data transfer is included. 
When you migrate to a cloud solution, data transfer becomes that a la carte cost that you have to think about. When we started running the cost model for the Battlefront 2 on cloud, um, we didn't know how to look at data transfer and we almost solely looked at what the savings on just moving compute was. And then we got our first bill um, and it was way above what we expected to be getting charged for that. And that was the data transfer because we didn't include it into our modeling. Can we hit the next slide? So what do we do? So the first thing that we did is we started asking questions and there was no question that we would consider stupid. We asked the game team what the drivers of that cost were. We asked the game team what the benefits were. Um, we partnered with them to figure out if what they were doing with their data transfer was in line with their expectations, while also making sure that they knew that we did not inherently consider data transfer a bad cost. Fact, games talk. They talk out, they talk in, they are chatty. Um, the question that we needed to answer was if it was chatty for the right reasons. Uh, games send out data to players for just about everything. And that data, you know, was that data being sent out at the right times and at the right size? Um, and then we get data transfer in from those players. What are they engaging in? What choices are they making? What decisions are they making about the game? Eventually, it became this really interesting feedback loop. Um, we would send out data. We'd get data back. We'd associate that data um, with not only our revenue, but our engagement um, from our players. And then we'd make a decision. Do we need to change that, um, that data? Do we need to make it bigger, smaller, less frequent, more frequent? And then we'd repeat the cycle. You send it out again, you get data back, you make new decisions. Now we have a method to not only model um, and forecast data transfer, we also have assumptions that we can use to compare to actual usage when it doesn't match our forecast. All right, next slide. So what did we learn? Data transfer in our case is a required cost. It is not inherently good. It is not inherently bad. It's just required. Next, you can negotiate anything. It doesn't hurt to ask to, you know, for lower pricing. The worst someone is going to do is tell you no. And then you're not any worse off than you were when you started. Um, forecasting is always wrong. You can't control all of the cost drivers, but you can make them less wrong. And last but not least, and where we get into a lot of trouble is if you don't manage and have clear oversight of your data transfer, you can get a whopper of a bill later on and it gets way out of hand. Awesome, thanks. Thanks so much, Teresa. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's super, super helpful stuff. And, um, you know, I have a, a couple of follow-up questions for you, but before we jump in, I also want to take a moment um, and have Scott Meyer really uh, quickly introduce himself. And Scott, maybe um, after you introduce yourself, uh, if you're open to talking about how um, data transfer, uh, how you're dealing with data transfer costs, you know, containerization, and how those how containerization has impacted your costs. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Scott Meyer. I work for Spotify, and I work with Anders, for Anders, and focused on our cost optimization for cloud. And yeah, you know, as a streaming company, we certainly have a lot of network costs. Um, you know, at the same time, we are, you know, we're fully cloud native, so we don't have the issues of being, um, you know, having on-prem and in the cloud. But um, I, I want to talk a little bit about kind of some things we ran into with, um, with like Kubernetes networking and how, you know, we were, we were so surprised by um, our network costs. Um, so do I have time for a story or are we, um, how are we on um, the panel? Yeah, we're gonna take about 15 minutes total for the panel here. So if you can take maybe maybe a minute or two for a story. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll do like a two minute story on kind of what, what we experienced. So so we ran into um, a cost incident with, with Kubernetes networking 
And, you know, it was, we have good ways of allocating um, our, our compute. So our, our, um, our um, you know, CPU and RAM, you know, we're able to meter that data, um, bring it across different, different namespaces, uh, making a lot of sense that way, but we did not have the same with networking. So um, we had a lot of network costs attributed to one large Kubernetes project as a multi-tenant cluster, uh, but we didn't have a way of doing it um, with network. So what we did is we actually built um, some VPC flow log sampling uh, and having labeling injected into that. And then from that, we were able to actually allocate our, our Kubernetes network costs. And you know some of the solutions we came up with were to um, actually introduce compression in certain areas. So we had some ML jobs that were huge and had, had really, really heavy payloads. So once we had those flow log sampling, we were able to say, okay, these are the ones consuming a lot of space and network costs. And then, you know, in some cases, adding compression added like 80 or 90% uh, reduction in costs in the short-term solution. But then our long-term solution is to have better zone aware network routing. So, so we can have, um, you know, you know, if you're in like US Central or, you know, US East one zone A, you can, within that region, you can then talk to another service in zone A. And we were spending a ton of money, you know, going from like zone A to zone B within the same region. So we were able to kind of identify that and solve that through, you know, better zone aware uh, network routing, which in some cases you'd call it like application uh, routing and that kind of thing. So. I think that covers most of it, but but yeah, it was something that caught us by surprise and we weren't able to properly allocate it. But then once we were able to allocate it, uh, then it made a lot more sense um, who was it kind of 80-20 rule, you know, with everything, who was actually consuming that and then having the compression and, you know, eventually having zone aware routing is, you know, gonna be a huge cost saver for us in the future once we fully roll that out. Thanks a lot, Scott. Um, a couple of things, right? Number one, we always love stories here at the FinOps Foundation, and that was a great story. And uh, number two, thanks for sharing sort of your strategy for how you're tackling uh, data transfer costs and containers. Uh, I know a lot of folks, you know, just as they're getting a handle on more traditional infrastructure and allocating costs and, and building up chargeback models, uh, you introduce the complexity and lack of visibility of containers and trying to get sort of similar um, you know, visibility into that data and um, your strategy that you just described uh, sounds really interesting. Uh, for folks on the call who want to talk a little bit more with Scott, we're going to be doing a breakout room um, uh, related to data transfer. So stay tuned. You can join that conversation. Um, having said that, I did want to circle back to Teresa. Uh, and Teresa, if, if you are uh, got your finger on the mute button uh, handy, you had mentioned just as you were wrapping up your, your, your discussion around getting a handle on sort of um, and visibility into, into, into data transfer costs. And if you don't, um, they get out of hand really fast. Uh, you know what, it reminded me of a conversation we had a couple of weeks back where you were talking about making decisions around being okay with some costs. Can you, can you talk to us about that as it, for example, if I recall correctly, relates to user experience? Yeah. Um, so in our case, specifically in gaming and probably across a lot of, you know, other media uh, groups like Netflix or, or, or other streaming groups, there's a cost to player engagement and player sentiment. And it's all about um, making sure that you're spending money in the right places, but never jeopardizing your engagement from your end user. Uh, and in our case, data transfer is a huge part of that. Uh, without being able to send and collect data, we can't make informed decisions that will increase player engagement or increase player sentiment. So knowing that there is cost that is just the cost of doing business and doing business well is something to keep in mind. So we don't label something inherently bad um, or inherently good. It's just the cost of doing business. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks. Thanks for that. And yeah. Um, I have a quick follow-up for you as well, uh, kind of touching on the earlier part of your uh, discussion um, around your experiences at EA. If you had to give us a maybe one or two examples, um, sort of under the label of "if I knew then what I know now," um, you know, what how how has uh, managing data transfer costs changed from what you were originally were planning to do? 
Um, so when we started using cloud providers, we were adamant that the only way to manage data transfer and attribute it to the right end user was that we had to have single tenants in, in each account. So every game, every service, every application, we had to stand up a single new account for them. And then we would just attribute everything in that account to that end user. Um, in the last five years, we've certainly matured in that that world that where we are now allowing and really encouraging the idea of multi-tenancy, where you can set up the, uh, the baseline requirements for infrastructure for many games, many services, many applications, and it saves costs that way. But by doing so, we had to come up with a way to, to tag and attribute the data transfer as well as the compute to the right end user. So that Battlefront 2 uh, account that we stood up was a single tenant account when we stood it up. And now there's over seven games that are using that same account. And we're working with the studio who has managed to make it so that the data transfer inherits the tagging from the, the compute instance that is generating it. And we're using that now to allocate our costs for data transfer to the right users and overall reduce our waste. Um, so they really do go hand in hand. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. And I, I'm, I'll tell you, I'm really loving this discussion. So I'm really um, smart thinking around how to deal with a uh, slippery topic like uh, data transfer costs um, and, and kind of go beyond the traditional allocation and, and strategies for dealing with it. And, and sort of speaking of complications, uh, it's a good segue uh, maybe to bring back Andy, uh, who you, you all heard from earlier. Andy, you mind uh, touching a little bit about sort of your experiences and how you're dealing um, with data transfer costs from a hybrid cloud uh, scenario or perspective. Uh, I believe you, uh, you were talking when we were last chatted about Colo and, and cloud and the considerations there. Yep. So, so what we're doing in Citrix with a, with a number of our data heavy products is we're actually not using um, the cloud. Uh, we're using Colos. So, you know, we're, we're having Colo providers who, you know, specialize in, in the data transfer areas. Um, and we've undertaken our studies into it. Um, you know, the Colos are 10 times more expensive for their their compute cost, but they're a hundred times cheaper for their data transfers. So what we're looking at is those um, products that we have that are data transfer heavy, um, and it's transferring outside of the zones. Uh, we're we're using colos. Um, yeah, we've we've had the discussions with uh, the cloud providers. None of them can can match that sort of element. But we we have had and coming back to Scots, where it's sort of within the region, and you're doing data transfer within the region, and and talking about Teresa's negotiation um, by talking to one of the cloud providers, we've got to the situation where they're actually investigating whether they would yeah you know, whether they can offer. Trans data transfer within a region as a free offering. So that's something else that we're we're considering going forwards. But Colos is is the way we go because it works out uh, most economical for us on that point. Thanks, thanks, Andy. Thanks for sharing for sharing that. And um, I'd like to round out the discussion by inviting uh, Anders back in. Uh, you all heard from him earlier. He introduced himself. Anders, before I ask you your question, I just want to take a moment. Uh, earlier, you sent out an invitation for folks who want to learn how to run 100 miles. I would like to decline that inv invitation, uh, but I'm happy to take you for beers. If I remember correctly, there's a couple of nice pubs near the uh, Spotify offices in uh, Stockholm. So uh, having said that, uh, can you talk to us a little bit about um, you know, your perspective on current data transfer pricing models. I know you have some, some opinions there and there was some good conversation in the Slack channel as well. Um, well, first, the uh, uh, beers are actually quite a good recovery beverage after a long run. So um, so that's not, not a bad idea. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take you out whenever we, 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 you come to Stockholm. So uh, <clears throat> putting on my procurement uh, manager hat here, I'd like to shine some on the original sort of in intro story to this, which was the, the egregious egress cost post by Cloudflare. So you need to 
recall that they have some motivation in, in publishing that post. They are a vendor themselves. They are also charging for stock versus paying from flow and making a buck or two while doing this. And margins is, of course, something that a procurement specialist have a problem stomaching, particularly at this level. Uh, why is this happening? Well, buyers have no, no or limited choice and options. Uh, so there's a really strong architectural lock in here. Um, and this uh, like makes it a less of a fair and sustainable marketplace likely. Uh, in other three industry verticals, there's been a uh, similar situation, and, but it no longer is there. For example, why do we no longer pay for fees when we trade stock online with online brokers? We used to do that up until not that many years ago, actually. And then someone went ahead in a race towards zero on that. I think, I believe it was like JP Morgan Chase or something in the US and so forth, but it, it's the same over here in Europe right now. So it's no longer that situation. Some, some sort of event triggered or someone went ahead and it started resolving itself over time. Same thing has actually happened a little bit in the construction industry, which I spent 10 years in, where like 30% of the cost of the construction project is actually logistics, but it's sort of hidden away from the customer. And it's complexity you don't want to deal with really as a service customer, but once the prices go up a lot and it's outside your, your control and direct visibility, you get a little bit upset. So there, there appears to be a lack of transparency here. Um, how do cloud providers really back up their price for these kind of services? So uh, I think we should be thankful for cloud for, for opening up that discussion. And a lot of people have chimed in on Hacker News and other places talking about this. Um, something me and my colleagues discussed was like the CDN market behaves a little bit differently. It also gives Spotify users a better experience. So we don't really use the like the public cloud native CDNs. We use other like standalone CDNs and there's competition there. So it doesn't, we don't get that lock-in. So that's a little bit interesting. Uh, will we have to ask for regulations? Uh, I think the bad the license alliance is not really a regulatory thing. It's more of a cartel. I hope not because regulation tends to be outpaced by tech and then they become blockers to innovation. So we won't be happy for that if we ask for regulations here. Uh, will customer have to gang up on the vendors? I hope not, especially not in this forum because that decreases trust and innovation as well. So, but cartels aren't good for any market in the long run. So we need to get out of it somehow. Uh, and um, I'm curious on the solutions to this. I think like one vendor going ahead, like JP Morgan's did in online stock trading might be a, the, the trigger that we need. Another category vendor could also re-architect the value chain a little bit, perhaps, uh, and run like data lakes somewhere else, but some, some stuff needs to change. And I'm um, really curious on other options here, like what, what do you guys see here? I don't see a resolution in, in the near term, but in, within one or two or three years, there will definitely be a resolution. So that's the procurement specialist perspective on this. Thanks, thanks Anders. Uh, and as, as usual, always taking the conversation to the next level, um, so far, we've had a uh, good uh, conversation around uh, challenges, some strategies for advanced cost allocation, some of the challenges if you're in a hybrid cloud situation. Thank you all to the uh, thank you to all the panelists uh, for sharing their thoughts. And as I mentioned a moment ago, we'll, we'll be doing a breakout session, but also please don't forget there's lots of good conversation happening in the FinOps Slack. Uh, please uh, have your voices heard, come in there, talk with folks, ask questions, um, increase that tribal knowledge and uh, it'll benefit the community. And, and hopefully, you know, to Anders' point, uh, help us nudge forward to, to making things better around things that uh, lack transparency and uh, help us all uh, run cloud uh, more efficiently. Uh, so I think with that, JR, I'm going to hand that back to you or did I forget something? Yeah, no, you nailed the time and, and thank you panelists. I, I know that was a Short, short panel, but hoping you can all stick around for a few minutes in the breakouts to answer. There were a couple of questions that came in the chat that were really great. Uh, yeah, and, and again, thanks for the, the viewpoint, Teresa and, and Scott Unders and Andy. Uh, interesting stuff. So breakouts. Uh, Stacy, I think you've got these all queued up. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll pass to you with the reminder again to everybody of the, the code of conduct. Um, we talked about the first three points earlier. Really important, I think, in the conversation that just happened as well, and you all did a fantastic job at this. U.S. antitrust laws specifically say we cannot share information about how to negotiate with a specific vendor. So if you're talking about any types of negotiations, please do not call out any specific vendors. Talk in broader terms, because that is at least here against the law. Yeah, so we're all set. Um, I'm going to go ahead and 
What we're going to do is I have set up three different rooms for adopting FinOps, debt, uh, data transfer and waste reduction. And I'm going to randomly assign all of you to a room so you can at least get to a room to get started. You'll have the ability then to choose to go to a different room. I'm gonna be hanging out in this main room in case you get lost or if you need some help. Or if for some reason um, you have questions about just general FinOps stuff. Folks from the FinOps team, please do not forget to record your breakout room. Baz, I'm looking at you. All right, so I am going to go ahead and send everybody into a room. Again, I can help you uh, get to a room if, if it doesn't work. So enjoy, and I'll bring you back a little before the, the top of the hour. All right, JR, I might be here. I don't know. It didn't, it didn't. Some folks, you know, it, it always has a couple people that doesn't assign to rooms. Yeah, uh, anybody want us to move you anywhere? You yeah. left me out, Stacey. You cheat. I don't know how I did that. Where can I put you? Wherever you would like. I'm going to, I'm going to add you. I to trust waste, you. Waste reduction is where you're going. Eugene, I take it you're going to be speaking more next week, uh, next month. We should, we should catch up after the call. <laughs> Good to see your face. All right. Looks just like some folks didn't accept yet that move into the breakout room. Tristan, are you stuck as well? Some yeah, people. sure am. Okay. I'm going to just start assigning folks. Uh, Tristan, is there some place you wanted to go adopting FinOps uh, data transfer or waste reduction? I'm wide open uh, and different. Okay. The of them I think are uh, advantageous to be a part of. So choose a way. All right. All right. I've got you. Thank you. All right, anybody else that's showing as unassigned, I'm gonna randomly assign you to a room right now. So speak up. Stacey, can speaking. you move me to waste reduction, please? Yeah, I didn't see who was speaking. Okay, JK. Um, you should already be somewhere. I know I wasn't adopting FinOps, but I want to go to wasting waste okay, reduction. Okay, sure, I see now. Give me one second and I will get you over there. Thank you. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm sending you over there right now. Awesome. You're welcome. The rest of you, if unless we'll randomly assign you unless you got a call out. I'm hitting a couple of them here, Stacy. Getting people you got out. Got it. Yep. Perfect. That's the last one. All right. Should have got folks. Oh, hey, Michael. Did you get kicked yeah. out? Well, no. We, I think Joe and I both ended up in adoption somehow. Oh. Uh, so just coming back all right mike i'll go ahead and get you over all right oh i found you i got it okay oh. you got it yep waste reduction okay yeah that, uh, it's, they're a little confusing and yeah no, carmen can i put you in a room specifically or right now it looks like you're in adoption did you want to go someplace else might not be logged in right now not actually listening yep it looked like we, we got the right moderators in the right rooms there though, right? Looks like we got Yeah, it. yeah. I had, I already did that. Um, all right. So the folks that are still on here, it looks like you might have been assigned to a room and you just didn't accept Michael it. Martin. But if you want to do a chat, okay, Michael Martin. Kevin Michael. You got him? Okay. Got Carmen. I don't know where I put Carmen. I accidentally put you somewhere. <laughs> Um, Larry or Ricardo or Hagar, if you guys want to identify where you want to go, either in chat or not, I can get you there. Do you have Michael, um, JR? I'm trying to find him in the list, unfortunately. <laughs> this is a really long list. Mode. Yeah. Okay, Hagar, I'll get you to waste management. Okay. And we're really not covering anything in this room um, unless you have questions about something specific. It's really here to help other people out. Okay, okay, so waste reduction. Hagar, I'm sending you over there right now. Oh. Stacey, did you time the, the end of the breakout or do we uh, need I to? I have it. I'll, it. I'll, okay, I'll here you go, Michael. Manually. Okay, didn't know if that was right. I, one time it expired accidentally. Okay, Larry, I'm gonna send you to data transfer, no problem. Just so you guys know, we have a very long list of users that we have to scroll through. 
to find you. So thank you for Alexander. Do we have going yeah. somewhere as well? I've got him ready to go. Alexander, I'm going to bump you into data transfer. Uh, Tareem, did you want to go somewhere specific? You can let us know in chat, or you can let me know um, if you want to unmute. I'm going to head over to some rooms as well. I'll catch you in a bit. OK, I'll get, I got the rest of this. Cool. Ricardo, I will get you in data transfer. Um, uh, did it say anything? So let's just move you to a different one. Jared, uh, can you move yourself or do you need yep, me to move you? I got it. Okay, just making sure. Uh, oh, oh, Tarim, I think I might've got you to the wrong room. Hold on, I'll get you to data transfer as well. Ricardo to data transfer. Move to data transfer. Okay, and then Tarim. All right, last one. I'm going to get you there. Data transfer. One second here. Every time I get people settled, I get more people in. <laughs> Hold on here. Let's see. Let me find your name. It's doing some weird stuff on me here. Oh, it just went from alphabetical order to not. Okay, Tareem, data transfer, away you go. You're welcome, Melissa. <laughs> Do you want me to unmute you? I can. Here, hold on. There we go. Then I'll just start talking too much. Thank you. Okay. You guys are marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I get whiplash during this, um, trying to monitor like the chat, the multiple slacks going on. I can't on. imagine. You're it's, amazing. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you for thanks all for, your uh, voice too. No, thanks for participating. It went well. I thought your voice section went really well. So thank you. And I am a change management girl though. So then like, I was all excited that I got plopped in adoption and then all of a sudden I got whisked away. So uh, thank do you want you, me to though. drop you down to adoption again? Or Adoption? Me... Yes, I would love it. Cause my goal yes. was in waste management. I don't know if Nikita ended up there, but yeah, I always choose people over engineers. I mean, engineering, me I guess. Engineers are. <laughs> <laughs> Let me find you. If all of a sudden my list stopped being alphabetical for some section. So Melissa, I'll get you over into adoption once I find Thank your name. You. No problem. Have this awesome is the day. most glamorous of all the jobs that happen here, by the way. It's, it's the most important. The like well, you do amazing yeah. things. I don't, you are Thank such you. a ball juggler. You. you are absolutely amazing. I have the most respect. It's uh, it's all of the herding of cats that I do. Here yeah. we go. I found you. Thank you. All right. Bye. Have a good one. Or not. Well, I'll, there we go. Clive, it's recording. Do you want to come up here? Come on, up. Clive, up. Clive. Clive, up. Come on. Clive. Clive, come. No, come over here. Clive, come on, up. Up, come on. Here we go. Look. Can you say hi? Do you want to say hi to everybody? Come on. Weirdo.
Hello, everyone, and welcome back as you're all jumping over here. Hey, welcome back. I think we've got uh, those who are still around. Uh, for those who didn't make it through, we'll have to send this out to everybody else. But wanted to invite you all to check out these upcoming events. Uh, we've got new member Replex doing a uh, follow on to this conversation on the 26th. Uh, FinOps Summit, the next one of these is uh, second Thursday in September, which is what it's supposed to be on. This one was a little off. Uh, agenda for that coming out shortly. Uh, Aptio is doing a talk on unit economics, uh, which is a great topic with uh, Here Technologies, which is one of the first uh, FinOps Foundation charter members way back in 2019. And then we are also planning, if all things stay as they are, but we'll see a reInvent event. It's the first in-person FinOps Foundation event ever. Uh, if COVID doesn't uh, block us from having it, we'll see. Uh, that's on November 29th, so watch out for information on that. Of course, office hours every week as well. Um, thank you, everybody, speakers. You were amazing uh, participants for being here, uh, and especially to this team. Uh, this is the FinOps Foundation team, the, the magical team that makes all this happen behind the scenes. Stacy for, for running all the things, Rob for creating the educational stuff, Vaz for owning the framework, Steve for helping us growth and marketing, Kevin for doing our vendor partnerships, Andrew on all our content strategy, Tracy on programs and TAC, and William on ambassador programs and engagement. Thank you all for making this happen. And practitioners, uh, again, as always, love having you on this journey with us. Hope to see you next time. That is the end of our content. And we're going to leave the Zoom open now and stop recording for uh, office hours. Anything you want to chat about before we uh, get into next month. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>